Hey, what's up guys, and welcome to this lecture on cell biology. So, I'm going to start up here, and I'm going to ask the question, how do cells know where all proteins must go? Well, we know, um, central dogma, we go from DNA to, to RNA and to proteins. And here's just the start shown here, it's uh, in the nucleus, we have DNA, synthesized RNA, go to mRNA, and then the mRNA is spliced, and then it's exported into the uh, cytoplasm here, and then it then codes for a translation, or it codes for uh, amino acids that are then translated and into a protein. But this, this um, which may seem, something that may uh, seem strange is that the proteins are not actually made um, separately here in this uh, cytoplasm area, they actually are made um, on the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the surface area of that. So first off, I'm going to start here by uh, um, saying some terms that we should know. Uh, the first one is targeting, and targeting is direct protein, directing a protein to a certain location. So we have a protein here, and we need to direct it to a certain location, let's say the mitochondria, or the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And in order to do that, there are specific things needed so that the cell knows where it's supposed to go. And uh, another vocabulary term here is sorting. Um, and this is uh, proteins that have been targeted to the R, ER, endoplasmic reticulum, and then assorted from there. So when we target cells, um, in order to target them, they have to have a certain sequence of amino acids usually at the amino terminus, that acts as a signal to target the proteins to the mitochondria, to the ER, etc. Um, also note, uh, non-secretory is not selected to go through the ER to the lysosomes, etc. And secretory is selected to let out of the cell. And in order, to, uh, in order for targeting to occur, we need a signal sequence. And we also need a receptor to recognize the signal sequence. And sorry, I'm just going to say uh, non-secretory again. I think I said not selected. I meant to say not secreted to go through... Uh, they're not secreted by the cell. So now moving on here to... Moving on to the ER, to asking the question, is the ER involved in secreting cells? Now, scientists um, scientists began to realize and uh, postulate the, uh, pro the um, chance that uh, proteins are actually created using the ER. And so, how do these scientists uh, come to prove this? Well... They ended up doing uh, two experiments that I'm going to go through right now. Uh, the first one is they, they took a cell that is responsible for making secretory proteins. And, and to determine if the proteins went through the ER, they homogenized uh, the cell, which broke the, um, the, the plasma membrane on the outside of the cell. And this also ended up disrupting the ER which is um, a similar structure to the plasma membrane on the outside. And this ended up creating small vesicles called microsomes. And within the microsomes is what would be found within the lumen of the ER. So now we've got this, these separated microsomes, which are outside of the cell, and we can now analyze them to see um, if proteins can be found uh, within them. And so what happened is they... They have these microsomes, and they would expect that protein is within these microsomes, and that would prove that protein does have a step in uh, going to the ER to be uh, synthesized, and then it moves onward from there. And so what they did was they added a... They uh, treated... Um, they took two microsomes, and they treated one with a detergent, and this uh, broke the microsome layer, the uh, outside layer, and then they added a protease. So one of these microsomes was treated with a detergent, so their outer membrane was disrupted, 
and things could come in, and the other one was not disrupted, and things would not be able to come in. And what happened is they added a protease, protease afterward, and so the one with the disrupted microsome membrane, um, the protease was then able to come in and destroy proteins, if, they, if there were any, within the microsome. And in the other case, um, without the detergent, the protease was not able to get into the microsome and not able to degrade secretory protein if there is any in there. And what they then did was they then analyzed the uh, proteins by SDS page, or um, I'm sure they could use antibodies as well, but in this case we'll say they used uh, SDS page, and I talked about that in the previous lecture, and what this uh, what then occurred is they could see bands of protein, if there were any, and there were some proteins in the in the microsome that did not have uh, the detergent present and did not destroy the microsome uh, plasma membrane. And so this proved to scientists that yes, protein is in the ER at, at points during um, protein synthesis. And now I'm going to move on to a different experiment here that ended up proving uh, that the ER helps translate proteins. So what did they do here? They took mRNA, that encodes for the protein of interest, and they mixed it with protein translational apparatuses. And they were able to artificially synthesize protein in a tube. They then added microsomes and looked to see if proteins would go into the microsome. But they did not. And therefore, the microsome was used in the productor process. Because when they added microsomes, as proteins were being translated, proteins ended up in the microsomes. So just going to go over that once more quickly. Um, so they were able to artificially translate proteins without the microsome, um, inserting artificial translation factors. And when they decided to add microsomes, um, while these, uh, these proteins were being uh, translated, the, the proteins ended up within the microsomes. And this proved that, hey, if the proteins end up in the microsome, then these, the transcription factors uh, use this microsome to help create the proteins. And therefore, translocation and trans translation were shown to occur simultaneously. So now moving on here, what is needed to get to the ER? That's a good question. Okay, so to get to the ER, we first need a signal sequence as shown here. And so this, what happens is the mRNA is put into this, uh, attaches to this ribosome here, and the ribosome um, begins to translate it. And the first few uh, codons code for this uh, signal sequence here, and as soon as the signal sequence is recognized, uh, a signal recognition particle then binds, called SRP. The complex with the signal sequence bound to the SRP moves to the ER, where it binds to an SRP receptor. And that SRP receptor is right here, and you can see as they are bound together here. The protein then crosses the membrane with the help of a translocon, and the signal sequence is then cut by a signal peptidase. So as you can see, um, the protein ends up coming through here as shown, and signal peptidase cuts off this uh, signal sequence right here. Now, just going through this process a little further, the mRNA, uh, the first stretch here, as I said before, um, has amino acids that, uh, or has uh, bases that code for amino acids that are uh, part of a signal sequence that is recognized by SRP, as I said before, this guy right here, and binds the signal sequence and partially binds uh, for, rib for the ribosome, temporarily stopping translation. So it binds onto both of these and it partially stops translation. 
in order to bring it to this uh, SRP receptor. Um, and when, when GTP is bound to the SRP complex and the SRP receptor, it is easier for the complex to bind. So GTP is hard to see here, but it did bind here, and it's easier for this uh, complex here to stay together when GTP is bound here. Once it binds, the trans translocon, um, this blue thing right here, uh, the translocon opens, and the emerging peptide goes through. Uh, GTP is then hydrolyzed to GDP, as shown here in this reaction. And the hydrolysis promotes the dissociation of the SRP from the receptor. So the SRP can then move off into the cytosol and bind to another signal sequence. And that is shown by this SRP coming off and then binding again. So the translocon then allows the translation to continue. As you can see, the proteins are coming through, or the protein is coming through. And uh, translation then continues to the stop codon. And the protein then folds in the lumen with the help of a chaperone, or many chaperone proteins. So it comes in, and it's then being folded, and there are chaperone proteins not shown that are coming in. And this, of course, would be the stop codon area where it's coming apart. So protein modification in the ER. Um, So we just went over how the uh, this mRNA, mRNA sequence is uh, targeted to the ER. Now what happens in this area where the protein begins to fold? Well, we get specific proteolic, 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 proteolytic cleavage. We get glycosylation. We get formation of disulfide bonds. And we get folding of polypeptide chains. And firstly, I'm just going to go over here. I'm going to go over um, the formation of disulfide bonds right here. So uh, the, f the formation of disulfide bonds when exposed to the outside environment occurs. And in order to get them, uh, in order to get these um, disulfide bonds to occur where they are needed, um, inside the ER lumen, um, there are mechanisms in place to get these disulfide bonds to um, bond quickly. Um, and this is simply to get these disulfide bonds to bond in the correct manner. Because when uh, the protein does enter the outside of this uh, ER lumen, the disulfide bonds will begin to form. And, um, and that will, in most cases, alter the protein in a way that is uh, not supposed to be... Um, that it's not supposed to be altered. And here I'm going to go into glycosylation. So what happens here is there's a complex um, oligosaccharide here. Um, and oligosaccharide transferases transfer it into a specific amino acid. So this oligosaccharide is transferred onto a specific amino acid on the protein. <coughs> and when the sugar is put on, there is selective cleaving of some sugars. And this happens because glycosylation is important for protein folding. And so, as you can see here, we have um, a big branched uh, oligosaccharide, and it then starts to get cleaved to one, here you can see. And it's trim trimmed down into this structure here, as shown. And we'll get into this a little bit more in the protein folding, as I will show here. So as proteins emerge from the translocon, as coming up into this area here, um, it can be recognized by oligosaccharides uh, transferases, uh, BIP, calnexin, and calreticulum are then able to recognize sugars and insert them in a way that stops the entire protein from converging in on itself. As you know, uh, hydrophobic pieces um, individually, uh, or they will immediately bind, um, because as you know from the states of um, hydrophobic parts, they bind to each other, uh, like fats and, um, and plaques and stuff in humans. They, they bind to each other, and that's how you form these plaques that can be uh, 
a big issue um, in heart disease and such. And so, another thing called a PDI is able to form temporary disulfide bonds. And these chaperones, uh, all these chaperones, as said, uh, BIP, calnexin, and uh, such, these, these chaperones are able to help uh, fold um, the protein into an appropriate orientation. And so, as shown here, the protein is beginning to fold into its proper orientation, and everything's good to go. Now, looking here at protein import into the mitochondrial matrix. So, first off, there's HSP70 that binds to... Um, this protein here, and it guides it uh, to the uh, mitochondria. And what happens here is there is a TOM recognition receptor that binds a mitochondria targeting sequence. There's a targeting sequence here, and it binds to a TOM receptor, which is right here, TOM in green. And it is a translocon um, protein. It's an import receptor. And then Tom moves it along to another Tom that opens a translocon, and the protein will then go through. So um, it's moving here. This Tom here is moving to a tra translocon, and the protein is going to go through. And what then happens from here is uh, another, another protein complex called TIM guides it through the inner mitochondrial membrane. So Tom is on the outer mitochondrial membrane, it's translocan, translocan on the outer mitochondrial membrane, TOM, and TIM is translocan on the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's right here. So it's then guided through uh, TIM, and when the protein gets into the matrix, it, it, the matrix, it binds with uh, matrix HD70, or HSP70, sorry, and HSP70 prevents its misfolding. And a transaction ATP to ADP helps uh, pull protein through. And once the protein emerges, it is recognized by a matrix pro processing protease that then cleaves off mitochondria, the, the, mito the mitochondrial targeting sequence. And that's down here by this. And then the protein is then in the mitochondrial matrix and good to do its work. And thanks everybody for watching, and I hope you learned some. See you next time.